John Lee talks about directed thought and evaluation in the meditation as dealing with the breath. Figure out what kind of breathing feels best for you right now, where you can create a sense of well-being in the body, and then how you can make the best use of that sense of well-being, letting it spread down the nerves, down the blood vessels. Bathing the whole body, maintaining your focus with the breath. So the mind is willing to settle down. But sometimes you're dealing with hindrances, things that get in the way of your concentration. And here you can use directed thought and evaluation as well. Trying to figure out why the mind is attracted to a particular hindrance, like sensual desire, ill will, sloth and torpor, restlessness and anxiety, or uncertainty, all of which are aggravated in times of stress like this. Trying to figure out why the mind is attracted to these things and what it can do to get past them. Here it's good to remember that concentration it comes in several different lists in the Buddhist teachings. It's in the list of the factors for awakening. It's in the list for the five faculties. And the Buddha says that each of these lists has a particular mental quality that develops it. In the five faculties, concentration is developed by heedfulness. And the factors for awakening is developed by appropriate attention. So these two qualities give some guidance to your directed thought and evaluation as you're dealing with the hindrances. Appropriate attention is when you look at your actions and their consequences. In other words, when you see there's a problem, something's weighing down the mind. You don't go looking outside to blame things outside. You look inside to see how the mind is processing things, how it's fabricating things, and what the results are, whether they're skillful or not. The Buddha's image that he gives to Rahula when he's teaching Rahula about the practice as a whole is of a mirror. You look at your actions as a mirror to see what's going on in the mind. And you keep in mind the fact that these are actions. Take, for instance, the, the hindrance of sensual desire. The desire is focused on an object or focused on a narrative. And it tends to get very focused on those things. As the Buddha said, there is the kind of jhana that's focused on desire and all the different hindrances. But it's not right concentration. It is a kind of concentration, though. It's a kind of a concentration with blinders. Your focus is so much on the object and so much on particular details in the object that you're blinding yourself to a lot of other things. And so here the the function of appropriate attention is to take off the blinders, to look around, to be more circumspect. First to look at the object. Is it really as desirable as you like to make it think make it look in your fantasies? Try to look for the bad side as well. If you're lusting for a body, You know what to do. You take it apart, and it's 32 parts in your mind. Imagine all the parts laid out on the floor. Then ask yourself, okay, which is the part that you're lusting for? And say, so, well, not, those aren't the things I'm lusting for. I'm lusting for the body as it's all put together. But when it's all put together, it's made up out of these things. You can't lack any of these things and have a healthy body. You may decide that livers are unattractive, but can you imagine a human being alive without a liver? It's essential to there being a body. You think of the body as it grows older, as it dies, what it's going to be like. 
So lots of ways of taking off the blinders and looking more completely at what's going on. And then, of course, what's going on is not simply the object. It's the mind's activity in focusing on the object. Once you get a little bit of disenchantment with the object itself, then you can start looking at the activity the mind has, going around it. How are you feeding on this? How are you lying to yourself? Is this something really skillful? And this is the point where heedfulness comes in. Someone asked the other day what heedfulness is. I think the best answer is it's the opposite of being intoxicated, the opposite of being drunk. When you're drunk, you have no powers of judgment. You don't think about the consequences of what you're doing. Something comes in the mind, you want to do it, you just do it. And there's your judgment as to whether you will get some satisfaction out of doing that, even in the short term, is really impaired. With heedfulness, however, you do think about the long term, and you look carefully to see what you're doing, what's motivating what you're doing, and where it's taking you. And is it worth it? As the Buddha said, we tend to be intoxicated by three things. By youth, by health, by life. And so when you're intoxicated, thinking about sensuality, you see that you're wasting your time. You tell yourself, I've got a lot of time. I've got a lot of energy. I'm not going to die anytime soon. It doesn't matter if I waste a little time right now. Then, of course, it turns into lots of right nows, right nows, right nows, get wasted, wasted, wasted. And you develop bad habits in the mind, as the Buddha said, the things you tend to think about a lot bend the mind. So the next time it thinks, it's thinking gets bent in that direction like ruts in a road. The deeper the ruts, the harder it is to get out. Heedfulness works together with appropriate attention, because you think about actions and the consequences, and how what you're doing right now is going to make all the difference in the world, and you want to do it skillfully. So these are the terms in which you think in order to get past hindrances like sensual desire. You analyze the object, look at it fully, take off the blinders to see that it's not worth the desire. The same thing with ill will. If you really understood the person or the thing for which you have ill will, you'd realize that the ill will is not worth it. As the Buddha said, when you have ill will for things, it's a sign that you have wrong view. So you're not looking at the object fully, and you're not looking at your relationship to the object fully. When your obsession with the object begins to fade, then you can turn around and look at the action, what you're doing. You begin to see where the hindrance is coming from, where it's going to go. And it's something you really don't want to get involved with. In this way, you overcome your intoxication. Develop some dispassion. And from that dispassion, the hindrance can fall away. Because no matter how much the object may be there right in front of you, still you're the one who's creating the hindrance out of it out of your passion for the hindrance itself, actually. So once the passion fades away, you get that particular hindrance goes, and then you can get back to the breath, back to your concentration. As long as the mind is fascinated with thinking about things, have it think about the breath, all the ways you can play with the breath, 
times when you want the breath to be comfortable, times when you want it to be uncomfortable. Sometimes there are conditions in the body that require that you breathe in a way that doesn't really feel immediately that good. I've noticed in my own case, back when I had migraines, there were times when I would breathe and expand the abdomen as much as I could to the point where it was painful. Breathe quite heavily. And that got me out of the cycle of breathing that had been nurturing the migraine and reset the cycle. So there's a lot to learn about the breath if you pay attention and if you use your imagination. So instead of using your imagination to think thoughts of sensual desire, thoughts of ill will, whatever the hindrance, allow the breath to capture your imagination. Apply your appropriate attention and your heedfulness to the breath, realizing that this is going to be your friend. Because heedfulness is not just about the dangers that are out there, it's also about the safety that can be found if you change your actions. So try to get really familiar with the breath, its ins and outs. Because you're going to need this as a friend. Because as you get to know the breath, you get to know all the processes of fabrication going on in the mind. So that even when you have to leave the breath at the time of death, you've gained some familiarity with, with the mind itself. And that way you'll be prepared. That's what heedfulness is all about, being prepared. And appropriate attention points you to the fact that the work has to be done by you. You can't hope for someone else to come and do it for you, so you might as well do it now. <laughs>